As the president of the Nebraska Radiological Society, I welcome Judd W. Gurney, MD, who is fellow of the American College of Radiology and Charles A. Dobry, professor of radiology at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, as well as his uh, beloved wife, Mary, their family, friends, and colleagues to this exceptional silver medal ceremony of our society to honor the salient cont contributions of Judd Gurney to the profession of radiology in Nebraska and beyond. This medal is a testimonial to the hard work and dedication that Judd has demonstrated throughout his extraordinary career and has trained many fellow radiologists in a very unique and personal way. The affection that many of us feel for Judd's cheerful personality is reflected by the fact that so many of you are present here today to honor Judd. Personally, I want to thank for your gracious presence here the support of the executive committee for their unanimous decision to award this medal to Judd. The organization of today's event is in the hands of Gina and Sarah, who are the rocks of the management office of our society and have done a wonderful job to put together this event today. I also want to acknowledge the vendors and institutions who financially supported this event. The statutes of, of the society require that I should hand over the silver medal to Judd. However, I gladly want to um, hand over this task to uh, Craig Walker today and ask him to come to the podium. Thank you very much. Well, good evening. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Craig Walker, and it really is a pleasure to be here tonight to be your Master of Ceremonies. I'd like to encourage everybody to start eating. We're going to run the program during dinner, so if you'll go ahead and start with your salad, and we'll have the uh, waiters and, uh, come through and, and remove that when you're done. It is really a pleasure to be here to honor Judd Gurney. He's the 2010 Silver Medal recipient for the Nebraska Radio Radiologic Society. And, and like Dr. Hussein, I'd also like to acknowledge and thank our generous sponsors. It's without their uh, ongoing support that events like this would not be possible. The Nebraska Medical Center, Amersys, and if Dr. Rick Huntberger, if you'd stand and be recognized for your contributions, appreciate it. Rick is, uh, <laughs> Rick is CEO of, of Amersys, and, and uh, I uh, really appreciate uh, your support. We have uh, several bronze uh, sponsors, Castling Diagnostic, and I believe we've got several members of, uh, of, of their company here this evening. Mike Castling, if you're here, would you please stand? Gene Went, Andy, I know Andy, Andy Beer, Andy, <clears throat> Randy Wobig. Randy, nice to see you. Thank you very much for your support. Diagnostic Radiology PC, Dr. Kevin and Cindy Cauley, the Nebraska Medical Association, Dr. J. Thomas III and Marilyn McGreer, Radiologic Center Incorporated, and Radiologic Consultants PC. Again, I thank you all for your generous support. I'd also like to personally thank Dr. Kevin Cauley as chair of the Silver Medal Committee, has provided many hours of planning and oversight, and has ensured that this ceremony will be a success. And unfortunately, he and his wife were unable to attend this evening. As way of background, I'd like to reflect on, on the uh, uh, Silver Medal Award. Uh, it is the uh, highest award from our state society and really emphasizes both expertise and qualities in the professional and uh, personal aspects of, of the candidate's life. To be considered, a candidate must meet the following criteria, and I believe these are listed in your program. A minimum of 15 years of practice in the state of Nebraska, an outstanding record of accomplishments in radiology, an esteemed reputation as a radiologist in the state, 
and or nationally. Teacher, researcher, officer, skilled clinician, recognizing significant accomplishments in radiology and outstanding service to the chapter. And I'm sure you all agree that Judd clearly meets those. Our society has honored eight previous radiologists with this award during our 70 year history. <clears throat> and I will uh, read the names of those awarded, uh, previous awardees, and if they would stand, if they're in the audience, and please uh, remain standing till the end. Dr. Howard Hunt, Dr. Arnold Dowell, Dr. Charles Dobry, Linda, if you'll please stand. I know Linda's here somewhere. There she is. Linda, if you'll stand, please. Dr. Roger Harned, N. Patrick Kinney, Dr. Alan Dvork, Dr. Thomas Emery, and Dr. Joe Anderson. And I think all of these individuals deserve a round of applause for their. Tonight, we honor Dr. Judd Gurney, a radiologist who has exhibited excellence throughout his career and clearly meets the criteria for this award. I just played Jazzy Joe. September the 6th, 1962. Judge Gurney. When Judd was about a year and a half old, he got strep throat, which turned into rheumatic fever. So my mom ended up rocking him in a rocking chair and reading to him for hours and hours. I think this was the start of his lifelong love of reading. It was not unusual to see him sitting around the house reading the Reader's Digest. I say reading, but I should say looking. He was so young when he was doing that. I just started reading and I, and I, I just never stopped. It opened up my world, that's for sure, from Little River to Nebraska. I never went anywhere without a book in my hand. I started with comic books. Sergeant Fury and the Howling Commandos was my favorite comic book. And he developed a love for comic books. And in one of those, he found an offer that he could get a little microscope. He had to send in so many bazooka bubblegum wrappers. <laughs> so he sent away and got his microscope. I think this was the beginning of his love of science. I liked the sciences, I liked the biological sciences, and so I determined in, in high school that that's what I wanted to be was a doctor. I got into medical school and I only needed one class in my major to get my degree, and that would have been in uh, zoology. And I was tired of taking those classes. <laughs> so I ended up not getting a degree, and my mother was, uh, my mother was really pissed, and I didn't think it really made any difference <laughs> since, you know, I was going to medical school. So then when I got ready to graduate from medical school, I went to the registrar's office and said, uh, you know, I have a problem that I never got a degree and my mother has never forgiven me for it. He said, oh, that's no problem. We'll give you a bachelor's degree too. And so I'm probably one of the few people in the world that have a, a bachelor of medicine degree, which in the medical profession means I have a BM degree. <laughs> In those days, the uh, radiology department had this contest. They would put up unknown cases on a view box, and they had a little, you know, like a suggestion box where you'd write your name and, and uh, what you thought the diagnosis was. So I just started doing it, and then I had fun trying to figure out, you know, what the abnormalities were on the films and what the diagnosis was. In his year of internal medicine, he wanted to do something different. Radiology was more academic, and that's where he he wanted to be. 
and he says, I can do this until I'm 80. So I switched after my first year in internal medicine into, into radiology. I wish my legacy to be that I was a good teacher for the residents. They kept me young, you know. I did my best. I had a great career. Recorded Christmas 2009. Judge Gurney. The changes in radiology have been dramatic. When I started, everything was film-based. You got very good at being able to pull them out of the jacket and throw them up on the view box. We started switching over from reading on film to doing them on a monitor. The first time I did it, it scared the hell out of me because, you know, I missed a bunch of stuff going on the monitor. <laughs> and I realized that you had to practice. I mean, this was a new way of doing things. Very quickly you learned that He's not your average student. He's just so much smarter than everyone else. He's either been the author, co-author, or contributor to 10 textbooks in radiology. He has uh, had 95 uh, exhibits. The one that amazes me is he has been visiting professor at 54 institutions. Including uh, the University of uh, San Diego, Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, the Mayo Clinic, the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, University of Montreal, University of Ottawa, uh, just to name a few. His internal medicine colleagues thought so highly of Judd that he was made a professor of internal medicine in 2007. And believe me, uh, when our internal medicine friends uh, bestow such a title uh, on an individual of another discipline, it is well deserved. He presently holds the Charles Dobry Professorship to Radiology at UNMC. If we have a difficult case, especially in the chest area, uh, he's the one that uh, knows the answers. He is a superb diagnostic radiologist and a phenomenal chest radiologist. He is the go-to guy. He was always an excellent radiologist because he knew everything. We, we all learned from him. We call getting an opinion from Judd a gurney gram. And a gurney gram means I need Judd to look at this to help me understand what I'm seeing. Year in, year out, he is clearly recognized as, as one of our strongest teachers. He has tremendous skills in communicating with the residents. He's very good at it. You start out early in your career, you're the same, <laughs> you're the same age as the residents. Residents never get older, you know, they, they always stay the same age. Judd is by no means uh, an academic uh, prude. He is well liked by the residents. I would suspect in this day and age that he would be considered cool. I guess uh, you could say, or I will say, that the residents love him. I mean, I'm using the L word here. He, he's a radiology superstar. Dr. Gurney has this style about him that is so simple and you know, those of us who have actually tried to do what he does know that it's anything but simple. He was the best teacher because it was a very simple approach. He made it easy to understand. I think it's coined the Gurney dictation. It, it's nice and short and succinct and uh, elegant at the same time. I always uh, felt that the only difference between them and me was experience. And I knew that they would, you know, over time eventually catch up with me and I wanted to pour everything out that I could you know to help them catch up with me. What I will carry most with me is that the big picture is that you don't have to figure everything out but you do need to do your best. My time with the residents has been the most rewarding thing certainly in my career. One of the things that the, the Judd will uh, probably treasure the most is, is his impact on the number of the physicians that went through here. This has a great deal of impact on uh, the field of radiology by producing good radiologists. I, I really feel like the way I practice radiology, the way I work is, is, is because of him. I think when many of us came to UNMC, the thought that drove us was, will it make a difference that we've been here? 
the legacy and all the people he's trained really amplifies his impact. He can read an x-ray, but he can teach somebody to read a hundred x-rays. That's a wonderful thing to have in your wake as you go through your career. As far as my legacy is concerned, I'd like to be known that I was a good radiologist um, and that I was a good educator. I enjoyed teaching the residents, seeing them uh, have successful careers, and that I did my best. It is not an attempt by the society to save money on, on guest speakers, <clears throat> but uh, uh, Dr. Gurney is uh, a valued colleague and a friend of many of us. We've all benefited from his, his vast knowledge and expertise, his sharp wit, and his unwavering friendship. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Judd Gurney, who will present tonight's talk entitled, Thankful for Life's, for Life's Lessons. Judd? about me, Cards Over Dell, my professorship, and some final thoughts on what it is to have a miracle. So let's begin with Dr. One. Uh, the first lesson comes from my mother. <clears throat> and uh, if I just told you the lesson, it wouldn't mean anything without the context of who my mother was, so I need to explain it just a little bit. Now before I begin, I want you to know that my sister and I loved our mother. <laughs> but she made it damn hard. <laughs> my mother was the oldest of three. She had two younger brothers. Her mother was of English descent, her father of Irish descent, and she started out in life inheriting equal measures of stubbornness and temper from them. She was closest to my father in terms of, or her father in terms of temperament. And my grandfather was not a Norman Rockwell type grandfather. He never bounced us on his knee. Never patted us on the head, never told us stories, never played games with us. My grandfather was an unbelievably serious man. He was not mean to us by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, he was quite generous to us as we got older. But <clears throat> he had no time for idle chit chat. If you had a discussion with him, it had to be some serious topic whether that was politics, farming, the economy. He took the U.S. News and World Report and he was conversant in world affairs. And, and uh, as a young man raising his family, he went bankrupt twice, eventually became a successful farmer rancher. 
he developed a nationally known herd of short armed Herbert cattle. And I mention that because in that world, your cattle have to be uh, judged by your peers versus other cattle. And that's done by teenagers, either in uh, 4-H or FFA. So my mother would have been the first one to uh, get to the age when she could show cattle. And what my grandfather did at that point was uh, something that only he could explain. But he chose to give his best calves to other kids in the area who he thought were better at grooming and raising those cattle. And I can't imagine as a child, and that's your important business, uh, how that must have felt, especially to my mother. So what did my mother do? She took one of the shitty calves <laughs> and she turned it into a reserve grand champion at the Nebraska State Fair. <laughs> My grandfather was very driven, and his drive was internalized. The conflict that my sister and I had with our mother is that the drive that she had was directed like a laser right at us. And she demanded of us to be the best. And much as we tried, you don't always succeed. So that was the basic conflict in the family was that if we came in second, well, just as well come in last because there wasn't really much difference between those two positions. So she drove us very, very hard. So that's my mother. So the lesson I learned from her came at a very young age. I was probably five or six going to first grade. And I did something, which in the annals of time I've long forgotten. But I had a little smart out of the street, so I'm sure I had it coming. So she got annoyed and she looked at me and she said, you know, you're not as smart as you think you are. You're not as smart as you think you are. And I've never forgotten that. And the truth of that is, I wasn't as smart as I thought I was. At every level of my education, I was surrounded by students who were smarter than I was. When you're five or six years old and your mother tells you you're not very smart, you need to do something about it. So I just started reading. And I never stopped because it was the only way I knew how to get smarter. So in the summer reading program, I read an average of two books a day. I read fiction and nonfiction. I like biographies of Mendeleev and Rasputin. And I read The Adventures of Robin Hood. And one day I read Tom Sawyer, and the next day I read Huckleberry Finn. And so it certainly opened up my world and broadened my perspective and made me a lot smarter. The other thing I learned from you're not as smart as you think you are is to never be complacent. And throughout my professional career, I never felt like I could stop what I was doing and coast on what I already knew. I challenged myself daily to look at things differently, read about my cases, learn more things. I changed my style and how I dictated reports. And, and uh, so it made me a much better radiologist. So thank you, Mom. My second lesson comes from my father. I need to give him equal time as I talked about my mother. He was not nearly as uh, complex as <laughs> he was a good and decent man. He had a high school education, served in World War II in the Navy on the tiniest ship, ocean going vessel in the US Navy. The technical term was landing craft ship large, but uh, they were better known as the mighty midgets. After the war, he came back to Nebraska and he owned and operated a grain elevator in my hometown of Riverton. He was good to his customers and his customers were good to them. My, grand, my father had two hired hands that worked with him throughout his time that he owned the elevator. 
and their names are George and Nelson. I'm going to flash forward 40 years, and I was having some work done on my house, and I was talking to the guy that was doing the drywalling. It was winter time. And I asked him how long he'd been doing this work, and a little chit chat. And he said, well, he only did this kind of odd job in the winter because in the spring and through the fall, he worked at the local grain elevator. Flash back 40 years, and sometimes in Christmas time, Christmas holidays, my mother would have to go to work as a teacher. My sister was out of the house. So my dad would have to take me for the day, and we'd go down to the grain elevator, and he'd do some book work at this old roll top desk that he had. George and Nelson would sit around the pot bellied stove and drink coffee and play cards. And that's, that was the day. Obviously, there's nothing to do in the winter time. Occasionally, some farmer would come in and want some chicken feed and, and, uh, or some salt blocks. And it, <coughs> it dawned on me that the way granny elevators worked was it was seasonal works. So you let your help build in the winter time, and you hired them back in the spring. My dad didn't do that. So the next time I saw him, and he'd been long retired, I said, you know, all those years that you ran the elevator, you kept George and Nelson employed through the winter months. I said, why did you do that? My dad was not a great philosopher, but he said, well, I just thought every man deserved a turkey Christmas. We were not uh, wealthy by any stretch of the imagination. My folks were lifelong Democrats, and I realize I'm standing in front of a bunch of Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> not all. Uh, they were very active in the Democratic politics. They worked every election. Dad in the front, mom in the back, counting votes. My dad actually served as a county representative to the state convention one time, which he was very proud of. And as you know, one of the tenets of the Democratic Party is to tax the Republicans and give it to themselves. <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> I want you to know that that was my father. He actually lived those principles. He didn't have to keep those men hired, and they didn't expect to be during the winter months, but he kept them fully employed you know, throughout the year. So that was my father. Well, what did I learn from him? I was in high school, and uh, I couldn't go out for football until my junior year. And it was the one sport that my dad really enjoyed watching. He had played it in high school, and uh, the other sports, baseball, basketball, were things that he just didn't care much about. We all do things to please our parents. As you've gathered from my mother, that was a full-time job. <laughs> but I decided to go out for football. And uh, the problem was is that I only weighed 150 pounds. <laughs> and all my teammates were at least 25 or more pounds heavier than I was. And in the world of sports, at least in football, weight is a lot. Now, that would have been okay if I was standing on the sideline not playing, but I played every down of every game. Full-time on defense, full-time on offense, all punt teams, receiving teams. I never walked off the field. And the reason I played is because I was blessed with something which was, I was fast. I was the fastest kid in school at 20 yards. So the coach said, well, you're going to be a quarterback, and well, Congratulations, you're a running back. This is like, whoa, time out here. <laughs> now, running backs are kind of a glorious position, but let me just boil the football down to you. One tie has the ball, and there's only one ball. <laughs> and the idea is to one person would advance the ball down the field and try and score a touchdown. The problem is on the other side, there are 11 guys whose only job is to kill the ball carrier. <laughs> so, it was, I took quite a beating. I wasn't very happy about what I was doing. And my father 
it was a good enough judge of character that he recognized this. So one evening on the back steps, we were cleaning up some stuff from the garden. And he told me this story, which I've never forgotten. And he said, you know, there are going to be things that you do in life that you choose to do. And he said, the most important thing is to just always do the best that you can. And if you do the best you can, you'll have no regrets about what you did, and you'll have nothing that you'll ever be ashamed of. And I've never forgot that lesson. It's uh, served me well throughout my career in adult life. And, you know, quite frankly, I didn't exactly want my career to be over right now, but you know it is, and I did my best. So I have to thank my father for that. My sister. <laughs> I had one sister who was seven, eight years older than I was. So when I was little, I had two mothers. <laughs> I told you about one. <laughs> this one was much nicer to me. <laughs> and she protected her little brother as much as she could until she left and went to college and then I bore the whole brush on <laughs> by myself. As I said in the program, my sister would just stop what she was doing and come on in the kitchen and make a bunch of chocolate chip cookies. And bunch of brownies. I never asked her to do it. She never asked for anything in return. She just did it. And I gorged myself, especially on the chocolate chip cookies with ice cold milk. Oh my god. So you learn generosity. And you learn empathy. Which makes all the difference as a decision. Now, there are other lessons that I'm sure I learned from my sister. Unfortunately, I don't remember them. <laughs> when I was a baby, she would prop me up with the other dolls in her room, and she would teach school. So I'm sure there must have been some lessons in there somewhere, which is good. They say at the end of your life, you get to replay the whole thing. So I hope that's true, because I want to know what I learned when I was one years old with all the other dolls. <laughs> Act two. Um, Mary and I met, as I said, in the program playing um, ball at the Met Center on the co-ed team. She was second base and I was third. She took a liking to the shortstop. So I got rid of him and I moved over to shortstop. <laughs> That's what you get when you're in charge of the team. <laughs> Well, this fall will be our 25th year of marriage and it goes by very quickly. One can't be successful professionally without having a successful family at home. She's put up with all the moves she'd like to tell you about all those. <laughs> we moved to Milwaukee and we moved to Omaha. We moved back to Milwaukee. We moved back to Omaha. We went to Salt Lake City, back to Omaha. We went to Rochester, Minnesota, back to Omaha. <laughs> this is where we belong. And she never complained. She'd like to tell you the story, but she never complained. <laughs> and I had two wonderful children, my son, Ian and Annie. Both are in college, and at that age when you have to decide what you're going to do in life, and they have their whole world ahead of them. And it's been wonderful having them watching me go up. My circle of friends. <clears throat> At the end of our residency, we were sitting around talking, my fellow residents and I, and we talked about our friends that we've had in life. And as you know, you go from high school to college and you lose those friends. And you go from college to medical school and you lose those friends. And you go from medical school to residency and you lose those friends. And we sort of made a pact that, you know, we didn't want to lose touch with one another. Even though uh, two of us were going to be, you know, widely separated by distance. So, 
what did we do? We decided to get together once a year, whether our wives liked it or not. <laughs> and we went fishing. And we've gone fishing now for over 25 years. And in that time, we developed a deeper friendship. We had jobs, we lost jobs, we moved, we changed jobs, we had families, we raised boys and girls. The boys would come to fish camp with us. We taught them everything that their mothers told them not to learn. <laughs> we taught them how to make a fire, and how to drive a boat, and use a fillet knife, and swing an axe, all the things their mother told them not to be doing. And we had good times and we had personal tragedies. But we're there for each other. It's made a huge difference in my personal and professional life. So I'd like to thank my simple friends, my fishing buddies, Steve and Bruce and Randy, who are here with me this evening. <laughs> Lastly, <coughs> is my professional colleagues. I've been blessed to have two wonderful chairmen here at the University of Nebraska. Difference in style, but the same outcome is that they provided us a, a wonderful environment for the faculty that we could we could blossom in. Tom Emery hired me, and Craig Walker hired me back. And it's made all the difference in my career. They don't get any credit for me being here, yeah, but they really should, because it doesn't work without a good environment. And then the residents. As I said on the tape, your, your relationship with the residents change over the years. You start out your career at the same age, and you have very little more experience than they do. The residents stay the same age, and you just get older. <laughs> I'm not necessarily wiser, but you get older. But I realized early on that the only difference between the residents and me was just one of experience. Not anything special that I knew or did. So I tried to treat them with the respect that they deserved as colleagues, and I may not have always succeeded, but that was my intention. I wanted them to be better than me. And that's come in handy because now I get all this imaging and they're reading my studies. <laughs> now, I've gotten lots of cards and letters over the last few months, many from my former residents. And They've said very nice things and are giving me way too much credit for the success that they're having in their careers. So I have a little secret. In watching you work and having you point out things that you don't know, and listening to you talk out loud, express yourselves, So I have to thank you for that, because it made me a much better radiologist. Act three. As you know, um, I got dealt kind of a bad set of cards in the spring of last year. I got a tray, an ace, and a deuce, an eight, and another deuce. And for those of you who play poker, I think you're probably throwing those cards and call it a night. But that's the cards I got, and you know what? They're pretty nice hand, and they're wonderful cards. And I'm playing them the best I can. In August of last year, I had a pulmonary embolus. For those of you who know I'm a chest radiologist, isn't that ironic that I would have something like that? And Anella and Craig came to my hospital room with a proposal to establish a professorship in my name. So I was deeply honored. But um, you can't just say you're going to do that. It requires a tremendous amount of work on their part, writing letters, paying for money. And of course, you don't want it to be unsuccessful. And uh, the climate was bad, worst recession in my lifetime. Money's tight, and if that wasn't bad enough, Congress is debating overhauling the health care system, and we've all been through that before, and we know what that means, so 
having people be generous at that point is um, questionable. So, half seriously, half joking, I said, well, I'm really honored, but I think you'll be lucky to raise 20 bucks. Then I looked at Mary. Mary looked at me. And I looked at Mary. And she looked back at me. And then I realized that maybe she wouldn't cough up for 20 bucks. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've never seen the list, so I don't know exactly all, all of the people who have donated, but thank you is obviously in order. It's not so important because it's my name. It will help the department to carry more residents in the future. <clears throat> I've had a tremendous outpouring of support over the last few months from former colleagues and residents and acquaintances across the country and it's easy to communicate with people these days and then Facebook and I am and email and text message and cell phone and cards and letters are still one of the most common ways that people have corresponded and I have a pile of letters on my desk six inches deep. Many of them are very touching. And I have to thank you for that. I would like if you don't mind, to share one of those with you here. First of all, I have to get my glasses on because I can't see shit with them. <laughs> all right. Dear Dr. Gurney, that's me. <laughs> I feel like as I already know you, and I've never had the chance to meet you. But alas, I seldom travel to Omaha, so this letter will have to suffice as our not so formal introduction. I am Melissa Bischoff's dad. You will never know the positive impact you've had on Melissa. She frequently speaks of you and writes about your abilities and interests. She's not easily impressed, but you have earned her highest respect as a practitioner and, more importantly, as a good person. I am sure she is but one of hundreds of residents who owe some of their diagnostic skills to you. The knowledge and skills embedded in your protégés are a legacy that will always be shared. I wish you and your family God's peace and comfort. I don't know. Okay. Lastly, many of you have expressed your hopes, desires, wishes, prayers. But I despair a miracle. I want you to know that I don't need a miracle. I don't need a miracle because, as you've seen from this evening, my life story, I don't need a miracle because I've already lived it. Thank you very much for attending this evening. It's a big honor for me to be here. Thank you. Well, Chad, thank you. Um, you know, you mentioned all the lessons and, and the things that you've learned in your life, and, and you can be assured that we've learned plenty from you as well. Just want to touch on a few things that uh, um, were in the program, um, speak to Judd's life and his career. And as he mentioned, he grew up in a small town, Riverton. It's very close to the Kansas border. In fact, I had to Google it tonight, even though I've lived in this state for 45 years, because I had no idea where Riverton was. As he mentioned, his mom was a school teacher and his dad ran the grain elevator. He graduated from Franklin High School as valedictorian, twice serving as class president, also serving as president of student council. 
After high school, Judd went to the University of Nebraska on a four-year Hawksworth Engineering Scholarship. He attended medical school at the University of Nebraska, and during medical school, he won the Alfred A. Richmond International Essay Contest from the American College of Chess Physicians on a paper that he wrote, ARDS, Update Pathophysiology and Management. Some of the chest, <clears throat> some of the pulmonologists at the university still speak of that. After medical school, he pursued a career in internal medicine at UNMC and again authored the best paper by a house officer at the Midwest Research Contest. As you know, Judd soon decided that radiology was a better fit, switching to residency at UNMC. His senior year, he served as president of the House Officers Association, and following completion of that, served as the Scanlon Fellow in Thoracic Imaging at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee under the direction of Dr. Larry Goodman. He was elected as a Fellow of the American College of Radiology in 1996. Judd's career in radiology was primarily at UNMC, and I am um, extremely grateful for that. He had short stints at Creighton, the Medical College of Wisconsin, the Mayo Clinic, and a one-year sabbatical at the University of Utah. While his primary interest in radiology has always been in thoracic imaging, over time the department always needed help, and Judd was always there for us. He read mammography, he did ultrasound, did neuroradiology, did body CT, and even volunteered to read a few knee MRs. As you know, as a thoracic radiologist, Judd is without equal. He's a specialist in pneumoconiosis and has served as a consultant for the CDC investigating vermiculite dust exposure in Libby, Montana. Judd served as the second Melvin Figley Fellow for Radiology Journalism, which is sponsored by the American Journal of Radiology. He has served as president of our society, as well as the Society of Thoracic Radiology. He's been a longtime examiner for the American Board of Radiology. He's authored 60 papers, 10 books, and one software program. His exhibits have won 10 awards at the RSNA and the ARS national meetings. He won the Fleischner Society Memorial Award for his paper, Likelihood of Malignancy in Solitary Pulmonary Nodules Using Bayesian Analysis. Dr. Gurney served on the editorial boards for both Radiology and the Journal of Thoracic Imaging, and has run his website, his own website since 1996, justxray.com. Judd has lectured widely, to say the least. Visiting professor over 50 times, traveling to Belgium and Brazil, giving four named lectures, he's given over 100 presentations throughout the United States and Canada. Judd finished his career at the University of Nebraska as the Charles A. Dobry Professor of Radiology. Judd, it gives me great, great pleasure to present our state's highest award. So if you would come up, please. So the silver, the silver medal from our society, National Radiologic Society founded in 1935, and on the back is it inscribed, Judd W. Gurney, MD, Silver Medal Award winner, 2010, Outstanding Service to Radiology, Physician, Scholar, Educator. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have a lot more to say. It says Judy Gurney. I'm just kidding. That was common growing up. Somebody sticking a Y on the end of my name. <coughs> All my classmates got a big kick out of that. Well, it's a English language is kind of <clears throat> interesting in that, you know, we borrowed from so many other languages and we have so many ways that we can express ourselves and the nuance uh, our vocabulary. But the phrase thank you is not one of those 
We say thank you when the waiter fills up our water glass. And we say thank you when you get us honor like this. Of course, there's a magnitude of difference between the two. I'm humbled by this award. And I'll just end with thank you. Good night, goodbye, and God bless. I guess I'd also like to conclude here and say thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. This is an outstanding turnout. Again, thank you to all of our generous sponsors, the Nebraska Medical Center, Amersys Incorporated, Casting Diagnostic, Kevin and Cindy Cauley, Nebraska Medical Association, Dr. Jay Thomas and Marilyn McGreer, Radiologic Center, Radiologic Consultants. Again, thank you very much for your generous support. Thank you for coming. Enjoy your evening.